welcome Ted to My Record Dealer. It's a pleasure to have you today with us. We haven't had the pleasure to meet in real life, unfortunately, but it's good that we meet online for the first time. We'll be able to share some stories. As I know, you've traveled a lot in Asia and uh, I have as well, so we'll probably have a lot of common stuff. So thanks for coming. Yeah, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu, as we say in Japan. Nihongo shabete sukoshi nai. Ah, not bad, not bad. Okay, all right. Uh. You're an individual dealer? Yeah, okay. the moment I'm still a private dealer. Uh, I've been doing this now for five years. I started DJing around 20 years ago. I grew up in the Netherlands. I've been DJing there mostly with house music. That's how I started and trance music. And from that on, I got into hip hop music and other genres as well. Okay. And uh, yeah, I've also been living in Japan for a while okay. and other countries during the past 15 years. So you've been traveling a lot? Yeah, a lot. What was the turning point for you between DJing and selling records? So I've been DJing on and off, I would say. I really started out of in, the, in the club scene 20 years ago when it was still easy to get a spot in a club. And I was very young. I was like 15, 16, 17, around mm. that age. Then in between those years, I kind of, yeah, I didn't really start digging a lot until I moved to Japan. When I moved okay. to Japan, my, my eyes opened again for the love of vinyl. And there's so many record stores there. There's It's like a new world. For me, that really sparked like everything. And uh, I started collecting first slowly it moved into selling reselling records and then kind of became a dealer for some people okay what year did you go to japan uh, around 2014 okay what was the reason for you to go there well actually it was by luck i was working in shanghai for a tech company around that time uh, i was not really satisfied with being in, in shanghai i took the boat to osaka traveled two days on the sea and yeah. i arrived in osaka and it was my first time in japan and i started traveling for three months months and then I got back to Europe and I was like you know what I want to go back to Japan through a way I found a way to get my visa uh papers and uh, got back into Japan and that's how it started. In Japan when you started uh, digging what impress you the, the most because uh, we've talked in this show already a little bit about digging in Japan but I think it's very hard for people who never went there to, to get the scale of what record digging in Japan is. What was the most impressive for you when you went there? So uh, when I moved to Japan I moved to a small town called uh, Numazu in Shizuoka. Through like uh, acquaintances I got to know like some local hi-fi stores and record stores. Not really the typical Tokyo stores where everything is already commercialized and mm. uh, really focused on, on on diggers itself. This was really like, you know, just an old guy in the 60s, 70s still selling yeah. some records for really cheap, you know. And I think the difference is, is that once you get out of the big cities, as in most countries, I would argue, you can still find good deals and you can still find that certain record that is really hard to find nowadays. So you just mm. have to talk to people and be lucky. And, and my Japanese is not fluent. Japanese people are very welcoming and uh, very, really willing to help you when they see that you cannot communicate properly. Yeah, and I think that was also for me. I traveled all over Japan uh, to the rural countryside and the rural mm. villages. And there I just ask around, you know, and, and slowly I get a connection from, okay, you should visit this person. And mm. they show me like their collection. And, and that's kind of how it started for me. Oh, I see. So how do you uh, do business nowadays as a private dealer? Like you get people like incoming requests from people that ask you, oh, can you find me? me this record can you find me that record yeah i uh, i try to avoid discogs actually i'm not really a big fan of it because first of all the the, the cost involved in it it takes a lot of time and effort and, and mm. money to also go to a certain country and to go digging mm. and to find a certain record i would rather keep it very personal i have uh, some fixed clients for the last couple of years that that still have a one list for me mm. and yeah i try to focus on kind of premium stuff things that are uh, not the cheapest but also not the most expensive ones keep it off obviously affordable for people okay as much as possible so that's how i do it uh, i do direct sales with record mm -hmm. stores uh, with other people with other collectors uh, okay. as much as possible and how usually people uh, reach out to you like through email or you have an online uh, platform or how does it work yeah mostly it's social media facebook uh, and instagram instagram mostly actually I, I prefer that vinyl community is really good on instagram there's always somebody you can connect with that's how i kind of prefer it and obviously email is still uh, the old-fashioned way for me. I see and uh, do you have some genre that you're specialized in? Pretty much still Japanese jazz okay. although I am also focusing on other genres like rock, mm -hmm. American rock mostly or you know Japanese
is psychedelic rock. Okay. City pop has come also into the selling uh, in the last couple of years, I would say. All right, great. Maybe we can move to the records you have selected for us today. What's the first one? So the first record that I selected is from a Mexican band called Punta Diamante. They released their first LP last year, or, yeah, beginning of this year, called okay. uh, Afrodelia. They are from Mexico and uh, perhaps some musicians are in the United States, but they are a Mexican band. Okay. And they focus on uh, jazz and Afrobeat. It's really a, a beautiful fusion, I would say. There is uh, not a lot of copies available. This one is actually signed by the whole band. Oh, uh, cool. Because I, I got to know the drummer in Mexico, uh, where I currently live. How did you first hear about this record? So um, I've been living in Mexico City for the past year, and okay. I've been digging there a lot. I got to know a lot of people and musicians. And I think through an acquaintance, I got to know the drummer of this mm -hmm. band. And okay. uh, he invited me to the studio. And then he let me play the record and I instantly like Liked fell it. in love with it. For everybody who loves Everbeats or jazz okay. funk, they just instantly attracted to this, I think. Cool. All the band members, they're like young guys do, doing uh, like a jazz yeah. funk and afro? Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure you can see the picture on the back. Mm, okay, uh, yeah, I see. I think this is just a, a small percentage of the, the band members. I think there's like 14 people yeah, in the whole yeah. band and they all um, like adding something to it. Okay, great. Can you play a track for us? Yeah. So the track I'm gonna play is Banguino Groove. Okay. interesting like it's um, the beginning is very soft but from the middle it starts yeah. getting very like uh, energetic and uh, way more afro yeah and I think this is the band is still very unknown I've been trying to promote it as much as possible and I think it's they really have an appeal in the Western market in Europe and United States unfortunately the right now they there's not a lot of gigs going on because of COVID of course oh, yeah but I think this is also something about Mexico right now where there's uh, the whole jazz scene and like fusion scene is growing there's a lot of djs a lot of uh, vinyl collectors there yeah and, and it, it is growing i think for sure and yeah well, it's a good reflection interesting. i mean i really like this track the the afro vibe i would say comes a lot from the the horn sections like some uh, fella stuff from the 70s and uh, you really get that strong afro beat vibe yeah and i think to give them an example again what they're using is also a lot of in uh, uh, indigenous uh, mexican indigenous instruments like oh, a lot really? of sounds you hear there you you can hear that there's some mexican influence in there for sure from okay. the history and then the same thing you know with a record like Tino Contreras reissued by Jules Peterson uh, earlier this year you know Mexico has a long tradition with traditional music and I think with them is something that they want to convey to the world I see well even the the cover art it feels like kind of a mix of 
Afro vibes and also Mexican vibes, the crossing path of uh, the two cultures. Very interesting. Yeah. So this one, it's a new copy, right? It's not second hand. Yeah, it's a new copy. I have uh, only like a handful of copies. They are the only ones that are signed. So if people are interested to learn something new about uh, uh, this band, it's for sure yeah. it's a great record to have. All right. So let's move on to the second record. What did you pick? The second record I picked is uh, Mi Hokei and uh, Jazz 11. A beautiful Japanese spiritual jazz record. It's you have to listen from the beginning till the end because uh, it's really like a story, like a, a kabuki story, you know, like a like a, almost like an opera. Yeah. It's not for everyone, I would say. It's really like a sonra record almost, but then in Japanese, but then also not. You know, it, it, it is still nice to listen to it. It's just a beautiful, a lot of drum breaks on it. It's very hard to find the original. The original was, I saw it recently, I think with Face Records, a couple thousand dollars, uh, I yeah. think it sold. Earlier this year, I did found the 45. Yusuke Ogawa, who you yeah. also interviewed from Universe Sounds, they did a special promo pressing for the the 45 it's also very hard to find but i, I finally got my copy earlier this year so thank cool. you uh yeah. <laughs> <it's okay. laughs> yeah this one i've i've seen it in some special sale when i was in japan like just sales but yeah you i mean i don't know i've seen it maybe twice or three times in, in like 10 years it's, it's really really hard to find record and uh, for me i've checked it once and as you say like it was It was a bit hard to get into. It's really like a, yeah. a specific record. It goes in many different directions, like uh, free elements, some elements that are more hard bop, some elements that are more like uh, jazz rock. In the track, it changed from one to the other. And uh, it's very, very interesting. Very interesting. It's really a concept album, you could say. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this is the reissue, just to be clear. Uh, okay. I think it was on the Think label. It's a okay. like independent Japanese label. And uh, mm. it was officially remastered, so it's a good quality reissue. Oh, okay. But even the reissue is hard to find. Uh, oh, yeah. I never see it in Japan, so yeah. Okay, so yeah. Uh, can you play one of the... I mean, one of the track, maybe a part of a track for us? Yes, I will do that. So I'm gonna play track number two. It's called Iwazaru. Okay. And uh, yeah, here you go. The titling of the first part of the album is called Kokezaru and it's divided in three parts which are like uh, Iwazaru, Mizaru and uh, Kikozaru or Kikoizaru, something like that. And mm. it's a direct reference to the three monkeys, you know, who have like the yes, yeah. hear no evil, see no evil and, and speak no evil. Actually, I visited the place, I don't know if you have, it's in Nikko. Uh, it's a sculpture on a temple where you have the three monkeys in this special position and it comes from this. 
and、uh, Iwazaru, Kikozaru, and Mizaru. It actually means don't say, don't hear, and don't see. The funny thing is, in Japanese, monkey is saru. So it's kind of a play on word between don't say and like the speaking monkey or like. Hearing monkey and don't hear.、Yeah. For people who who don't know what the title is about, that's what it it refers to. Yeah. Well, thank you for explaining. Because、yeah. <laughs> I, I, although I kind of knew, I think other people don't know. I think it's important to know. Once you listen to it, it, it kind of makes sense.、Mm. Uh, like I said, it's a very spiritual record, and it, you know, you you can hear the, the the evil spirits and ghosts kind of haunting in the background.、Mm-hmm. And I think it's、uh, it's definitely a mystery record, for sure. Yeah.、So、what what I really liked in the track you played, the Iwazaru. It's like it shifts from stuff that are a little bit jazz funk-ish to jazz rock. There's like a, a small、mm. jazz rock part, and then like more hard bop style, and it's、uh, it really all goes together. It kind of feels like they're playing live and they're shifting the the style and and coming back and forth. It's very interesting, very interesting record. Yeah, for sure. I think they improvise、yeah. a lot on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as you said, the, the copy you have for sale is、uh, the reissue one. What's the the condition? Is it in good condition? Yeah, it's still new. Oh, it's new. Yeah, there、oh, were great, only、okay. like、uh, I think three hundred and twenty five copies made. They all numbered as well, and、uh, I think they were yeah remastered in Japan. Awesome. So、um, maybe we can move to the third record. What what do you have? Yeah. So the the third record is a very special record for me.、Mm. Misa Suzuki、uh, yeah. Blow Up. Yeah, one of his most famous record、yeah. recordings, I would say, especially with collectors. I met Suzuki San、uh, two times now in person. Oh wow. For, uh, uh, okay. I, he still performs actually.、Uh, yeah, normally yeah, yeah. in Yokohama. So <laughs> if if anybody wants to catch him, I should just see <laughs> how his schedule is normally. But、okay. this record is very beautiful. Beautiful. I think it starts like you know really with a bass. You know he's a bass player from Japan,、mm. and uh, Suzuki uh, he played with everybody. You know all the famous jazz musicians you can imagine. Yeah,、uh, yeah. Thelonious Monk,、uh, Art Blakey.、Uh, he played with everybody、yeah. uh, as a session musician. And、uh, yeah, this record is one of my favorite.、Uh, this copy is signed by Suzuki as well. So you have you have an、uh, or- is it original or reissue? Because I think this one's been reissued as well, right? Yeah, this.、Uh, I mean, I I do have the first pressing. I think there's like five pressings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have this is the the third pressing. It's normally、uh, one of the cheaper ones, but yeah. still、uh, very good quality. Sometimes even better than the the first pressing. Yeah. So and、uh, this one is from、uh, Isao Suzuki Trio, right? One of the guy who plays in this trio also made an album that is very good. He made an album with uh, uh, Herbie Hancock. Ah,、yeah. uh, the、uh, Takashi Mi-、uh, Mizuhashi. Yeah, exactly. Title of the album is One Evening in New York. It's a white、oh. cover. Nice, very good one. So yeah, the the I mean the lineup for Blow Up is a really really good and、uh, strong lineup, definitely. Yeah, when I see Suzuki perform, like I saw him perform in February early、mm-hmm. this year, it was also a quartet formation. He's seventy eight years old, I think, but、oh, cool. he's、uh, very eccentric and very energetic. It's just wonderful to to see him perform so. Oh, cool! I remember when I I went to Japan, I、uh, I wanted to see some of the artists I like I really liked and、uh, like the old ones. But some of them don't perform that often anymore. And I went to、yeah. see、uh, Yoshida Minako in a small venue, not not too big. And I brought my records to have them signed because I was like, that's once in a lifetime chance. So、yes. I went there.、Yeah. The concert was nice, although she didn't sing any of her '70s、uh, hits. And I was a bit disappointed because I was expecting some of the more like a soul funky stuff from the '70s. But and at the end of the gig, she went back backstage, like no signing at all. And I was there with. My、wow. record, <laughs> like, oh no, come on, like, came all the way. So I went to see the venue manager, and I kind of play my、uh, gaijin card, and I start talking to him in English. Said, yeah, you know, I came especially to see uh, uh, Miss uh, Yoshida, and I have a record. I'm a big fan. Do you think I, I can get them signed or something? He was like, okay, give me a second. He took my record. He went into backstage, and then he came back, and he was like, okay, she signed them for you. She, she actually <laughs> signed my.、Uh, By Yoshida Minako's record collection, I had like at that time I had like four or five of her albums, most of、mm. her 70s 
70s uh, produced album. And he came back with the signed record and I was so happy. But I, I felt like it was very special because she, did, she didn't have any signing session. Apparently, she doesn't really like that. She was quite uh, touched and impressed that a, a foreigner uh, had some, some of her early works, you know, because at that time when I saw her, Japanese revival was not there yet. I think I saw her in 2013 or 14, something like that. So it was still kind of early and I think she wasn't aware of the popularity that she had gained uh, in the West yet. So she was uh, she was pretty happy to do that. Well, at least you got it signed, you know. That, yeah, exactly. Something. Yes. In Japan, it's very hard. I think the musicians that we listen to, maybe the audience are mostly like 50, 60 year olds, you know. And then there's like some foreigner, like young person coming in there with records. For me too, I had to kind of push myself. Kosuke Hino from the Three Blind Mice, uh, he performed also earlier this year. And it was a very uh, private, like a small jazz club in the mm. in Shinjuku. Yeah, the people there, they they don't really tell you like you can go sign. No, you just yeah. have to go directly to the artist yeah. and, and yeah. just like be like yeah, very yeah. blunt. <laughs> Play your gaijin card and then it's yeah, like, exactly. okay. <laughs> the gaijin card, very useful. <laughs> Those guys, they produced this music back in the 70s or 60s or early 80s. Yeah. And it was produced at the time where those records would stay in Japan. They were not exported, like except maybe for Waiemo or one or two other like major Japanese artists. But most of Japanese artists would stay in Japan. So those guys never thought that people from Netherlands or France or the United States would one day come with one of their record and be like oh I'm no. one of your biggest fan like I love this album can you sign it you know it's like what the fuck's happening <laughs> yeah especially like 50 years later or 60 years yeah. later for them you know yeah. these guys are all, all in the 70s already yeah uh, and I think for them it's, it's still beautiful that they get to perform and that people still enjoy their music yeah it's great and I'm really happy for all those great musicians that benefit from this revival yeah for sure yeah great stuff. okay so can can you play uh, one of the track for us? That's a great track, but I have kind of a hard time to... Like, if somebody asked me what type of jazz is this track, I think I would have a hard time to classify it in one specific jazz color, you know? It's not jazz funk, it's not hard bob, it's not spiritual. How would you... How would you describe this jazz track particularly? Yeah, I think with uh, Suzuki's music, his own work especially, it's mm. more like, you know, modern jazz, like uh, post-bop, definitely not spiritual. I'm yeah. not into spiritual jazz myself in general. Uh, I can't really listen to Sun Ra, for example. It's just too much for me. Yeah, it's same uh, for me. I like some type of spiritual jazz, but the Sun Ra side of the spiritual is it's too experimental for me. It's like way out there. Yeah. All right, yeah. 
So uh, maybe we can move on to the next record, the first one. What did you choose? Yeah, the, the fourth record that I picked is by probably one of my favorite bands of all time, especially in Japan. Uh, they're yeah. called Happy End. That's a legendary band. Yes. So this is the second album of uh, Happy End, though. Well, technically, it's the third uh, the third band from uh, Haromi Hosono. Yeah, obviously, most people know Hosono from uh, YMO, Yellow Magic Orchestra. Before that, uh, he had a brief band called uh, Blue Valentine and April Fool, which is more uh, psychedelic rock orientated. Okay. April Fool, I know about this one, but Blue Valentine, I never heard. Yeah, I think the, we still need to wait for a release of that because uh, it was very short-lived. It was actually before they released the first album of Happy End. In 1970, they released it. Within that year, 1969-1970, they were still a backup band for uh, Nobuyasu Okabayashi. Okabayashi, he is known as the Japanese Bob Dylan if you want to say it. Before 1970, Japanese musicians yeah. were either covering everything in English. You know, there was a big folk festival in Nakatsugawa in the Gifu prefecture okay. and uh, that happened from 1968 till 72, I believe. Okay. And it was actually at the same time as Woodstock almost. They had a festival where you can still see Happy End play in the background uh, as a backup band. Oh, wow. Uh, it's yeah, very, it's there's like, some footage. There's still some video footage yeah i posted it on instagram as well many times but i think i mean if you go on youtube it's very interesting to see because uh, i think 1970 is really the changing point in japanese music in general what happy ends big different is is that they started singing their songs in japanese and that was really unusual for a lot of bands that really wanted to reach like the world uh, yeah. with their music can you tell us a little bit more about who's the the member of happy end because i think it tells a lot about the influence that this band has had later on because it, when you look at the list of the member it's just like the superheroes of, of, of Japanese music you know yeah so obviously it starts with uh, Harumi Hosono mm. uh, then we got uh, Eiichi uh, Otaki yeah. uh, and then uh, Shig Shigeru Suzuki yeah. uh, Takashi Matsumoto who is yeah. the drummer all four of them are like well, I wouldn't really compare them with the Beatles because the yeah. Beatles were never really musicians, you know, they never uh, did their <laughs> own stuff. Only Paul McCartney, he wrote, but that's another thing. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> you're gonna upset a lot of uh, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, pro probably. Uh, you know, that's okay. I mean, the thing is with these musicians, they are uh, you know really pioneers in Japan in their yeah. own way. They they write their own music. They were really influenced by Californian rock music mm. from the '60s. That's something you can definitely hear in their music for mm. sure. There's yeah. a lot of Americana feeling in it. Yeah, I mean, when you look uh, like at the lineup, as you said, like Shigeru Suzuki or. Eichi Otaki and Haru Miyosono, they've, they've all had like an incredible solo career as musicians and they've produced a lot as well for other musicians. To give people an, an idea of the influence of Hosono, basically, I think on every video I've met so far talking about Japanese music, his name came up because he has like a huge influence on, on a lot of musical style uh, developing in Japan. Eiichi Otaki is uh, also like a huge, huge, huge pop rock, pop artist in Japan. If you don't know about him, check his albums. My favorite uh, track is uh, Ame no Wednesday. It's a really, really nice pop ballad. Uh, and Shigeru Suzuki is awesome guitar player he's done a lot of soul funk stuff late 70s early 80s and uh, also late 80s he's produced some more uh, ambient guitar stuff which are less known work of his but that are also really really awesome so i really encourage you to dig into every musician who is part of happy end and happy end was the origin it's really like a milestone for japanese music i think yeah i definitely agree with yeah. that shigeru uh bandwagon lp it's yeah phenomenal you know it's a very beautiful record with otaki he's definitely more on the pop side i would say yeah. it's not uh for everyone uh, i mean yeah. i don't like all his music but he's a great writer yeah yeah, yeah exactly music. otaki it's, it's less my stuff but i know yeah. that he has a huge influence in uh, japanese culture he was really really big like i would say more commercial than suzuki or even osano maybe osano was more commercial through uh, yemo but his solo works were so different than Waymo's 
those work and they were more hedgy. So I think Otaki had more reach through his uh, solo work. Yeah, I definitely think so as well. I mean, yeah. the artwork alone on, on his yeah. records or, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and also I think they work with Tatsuro Yamasta as well yeah. at some yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's definitely a sort of Hawaiian vibe oh, uh, yeah. to it. I think all of them are definitely inspired by Hawaii yeah. in a way. Yeah. Being on the Pacific as Japan is, I think there's definitely that island vibe it yeah. and i think they love it you know that's one thing i love about the 80s in japan is that you feel the economic boom through music also through the image that goes with the music when you look at the sleeve the cover art uh, the insert in the 80s you had like crazy inserts sometimes like a uh, really well printed stuff with beautiful pictures and all that and a lot of them had a theme of resort hawaii blue sky blue sea the sun swimming with the fishes and a convertible car driving by the sea and so on and so on. So all this imagery comes from probably Japanese people uh, being able to go on vacation thanks to the economic boom and discovering the pleasure of leisure and the sea life and going to Hawaii and going to resorts and all that. And the music that was produced in those times, it really reflects this mentality and you can feel it in the influence of the music because it takes a lot of influences from uh, like Southeast Asia Asia, for instance, or uh, more local stuff from uh, Hawaii or Okinawa or stuff like that. And also in all the, as I was saying, in all the images that go with the records, like the pictures on the jacket, the art, uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think also now it's very popular because of the city pop. You know, obviously Tatsuro Yamasta, uh, which I will talk later about being in Hawaii, you know, going there. There's a lot of Japanese who grew up there who go back yeah. to Japan eventually. Hmm. So yeah. Okay, so back to Happy Hand, can you play uh, one of the tracks for us? Inaka no shiroi Aze michi de Hokori toi kaze ga Tachi domaru Jibeta ni petan to ちゃがみこみ奴らがビーダマ静けさが古い茶屋の店先に誰かさんとぶら下がる押しつくつくの蝉の声です押しつくつくの it's very soft rock, really chill. I really love the way uh, Hosono sings on it. I mean, he does that very often. He had several layers to his voice, you know, like he sings over yeah. his own voice, which gives like depth to his singing and, and it's really, really warm and uh, and comfy. Yeah, I mean, this record really, it's not my favorite record of them. I mean, they don't have a lot of records, but the first album was definitely, it's my favorite. Their uh, first album is more rock, right? Yeah, I think it was really the, the time where they, uh, you know, they just got out of April Fool band, yeah. uh, the psychedelic rock, uh, they just left it behind and, and they mm. still were trying to find their own voice. There's a couple 45 singles in Japan that was made between 69 and 1970, which was kind of the, the food ground for what Happy End become. There's definitely that, that rock, psychedelic rock, that Californian rock vibe to it, you know, is definitely their way of showing who Happy End is to 
with the rest of the world. It's also on this album that you have the track called uh, Kazeo Atsumete, which is uh, probably their most famous track. You actually notified me that it's been used on Lost in Translation, which I didn't know. I watched the movie a long yeah. time ago, I think, when, when it came out. I didn't notice the, the track because when the movie came out, I didn't know about Happy End because that was a long time ago, obviously. And when I discovered the Happy End, I didn't connect the dots. I, I didn't notice it was a track that was used in this uh, in this movie. So now I get why this track is maybe sought after in uh, in the West. It's such a beautiful track. It's probably my favorite track of them with the one you played because the one you played also it's such a great track but the track Kazeo Atsumete it has been covered many times as well by different artists yeah. there is especially a cover that I like that has been done by Aki Koyano on her album called Granola during the 80s and it's a synth pop version uh, of Kazeo Atsumete which is way more electronic and uh, synth and a very interesting take feels uh, very differently from the original one but that has also some very nice aspects aspects to it. For people who don't know, I mean, they should definitely watch Lost in Translation. It's kind of a weird movie, I would say. It's very slow, but I think because of that movie, they mm. really became yeah. more known and their records starting to get uh, reissued again. Yeah. So it is it's kind of ironic and now, you know, now it's like everybody knows yeah. who Hosono is, but they yeah, don't yeah. necessarily know who at the end is. He's a Japanese treasure for sure. I oh, mean, yeah. uh, he performed in uh, LA, I think earlier this year and also in New York and, yeah. and even there in the United States is very popular. Yeah, all right. So let's move to the last record you've selected for us today. What is it? To come back to what I talked about before is by Tatsuru Yamasta, Come Along Part yeah. 2. I mean, it's just a great soundtrack record and just to put it on and listen to it you just kind of feel like you're on Hawaii you know with the the radio voice on it and yeah I mean now uh, everybody knows Tatsuri Yamasta definitely in the last 30 years I would argue that in that suddenly everybody wants his record like yeah. outside of Japan there was a time where you can find his records for so cheap and now it's <laughs> like everybody wants it you know it's crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he's become so popular like finally people outside Japan noticed but I was talking about Hosono being my favorite musician uh, ever like someone I really admire but in terms of influence on Japanese pop culture you cannot top Tatsuro Yamashita he's like he's literally the king like when he does concert he has to do lottery tickets so people have to apply to lottery and hope they get a ticket for the concert there is just so many people applying for a ticket it's just incredible it's it's basically like playing the normal lottery you know it's like you have one chest out of like several hundred thousands or millions yeah Tatsuro Yamashita I mean it, it would literally take one whole show to talk about him because he's he's done so many great stuff and he's at the origin of so many uh, great work but uh, yeah this this one is a I think it's a compilation of his uh, early 80s work that were more uh, on the funky side a lot of them come from the album For You probably one of his most popular uh, album right now in the in the west even if you don't speak Japanese the musicality of this album it's just so easy to get into it it's an incredible work yeah I mean I mean For You and Come Along both of them are very popular I think uh, besides Spacey, there are probably the most wanted records of Tatsuro yeah. Yamashita. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, the prices are going insane right now uh, as well. I think before you can still find it for 2,000 yen, which is around $20. And now it's at least average price is uh, 6,000 yen yeah. retail price. That's $60. And yeah. it's already getting to the $100. That's just how it is. I mean, it, it is very hard to find even in Japan. Yeah, that's just the reality. Yeah, but it's very funny because when he released For You and, and Come Along, he was already a huge artist in Japan. You know, like he was like a king of pop in Japan. His album were pressed like probably 100,000, like million copies. I don't know. I don't know how many copies, but probably in the several million copies. So there are a lot of copies out there. You know, it's not like, it's not a rare record per se. No, the, it's the, not. Yeah. The demand for it worldwide has grown so much over the past years that it's actually becoming a rare record on the worldwide scale. Yeah. I think a lot of copies have went outside Japan. So I don't know how many percent of the, like the For You or Come Along now 
sit uh, on shelves outside Japan, but I think this number is growing day by day because a lot of people want those copies and, uh, and they live in the West. So they need to get it somehow, probably through you. You've probably sold several, several yeah. copies for you. I definitely, I, I had a lot of copies, but I sold yeah. a lot already the last couple of years. In the end, it's also like, as a dealer, it's got to stay fun. You know, I don't want to spend the same price as how I'm going to sell it. That's not yeah. how it works. You know, I also mm -hmm. need to find it for a good price. But yeah, of course. I think this of is the, the big issue for many dealers and collectors in general is just to find for the right price. And if there's only five copies in, in whole of Europe available mm. for sale, I mean, yeah. you got to be realistic with the price. Yeah. You know, you got to understand, you know, like I have to go to Japan. Yeah, I have exactly. to go search for the record. Yeah. I think a lot of people forget that, you know, okay, I might as well pay a little bit extra because there's not many copies here. Um, yeah. that, I mean, that's just how it is. That's a tough one to get. Definitely a good one. I think come along the part two is a little bit easier to get than for you i don't know the recent development but uh, maybe i've seen it more often yes if you've never bought yeah. like a tatsuro yamashita work before come along is definitely a good way to get into uh, tatsuro yamashita's world yeah i would actually say uh, buy the greatest hits probably the, the easiest and the cheapest yeah. compilation of, of him and that's definitely a good record to have i think yeah, yeah. And, and also um, the artwork as you said it's uh, really like a, a blueprint of the type of artwork that you could find in japan during the 80s for like a pop artist <laughs> yeah the, the art the artwork is by i think 18 he's a popular artist who's done a lot of visual for pop artists yeah. in the 80s. He still uh, sells his own art in Japan, oh, mostly. Easy. Okay. Uh, so if you have a chance to meet him, apparently he's very friendly. Cool. You can actually buy directly from him. It's interesting how a lot of Japanese are so influenced or admired by California and like Hawaii. And knowing how the relationship in the past was yeah. a lot different, people still have this fascination about Californian life and, you know, Waikiki and, and stuff. And it, a lot of these Japanese don't even go there. It's through this record that they can kind of imagine their world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a fantasized view of America, like the American dream and uh, yeah, American sure. West Coast and all that. Like sometimes in Europe or uh, or in the States, we also have this version of Oriental Japan or like the fantasized Japan or fantasized China or stuff like that. Like, you, you, you could actually find a lot of that in the 80s in Europe. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's before the, the internet came up and uh, kind of rationalized everything and killed the no, magic. No, definitely, yeah. <laughs> All right, so can you play one of the tracks from uh, Come Along 2 for us?
the intro is like really, really good. The intro of Sparkle. You can feel like a good track is coming up. The the ballads are definitely, you know, hit or miss. It's not all my favorite things oh, yeah. to yeah, listen yeah. to ballads in general. True. But once you get into the, the funky stuff, it's like the bass guitars and yeah. it's just amazing. But I, I, I want to say that this, uh, even though, you know, people admire Tatsuro Yamasa, I think yeah. Toshiki Kadomatsu, in my opinion, is a little bit my more my favorite, I would say. Oh, Kadomatsu, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, he's, he's awesome too. But the type of sound is way different. The type of sound of Kadomatsu It's definitely is, more up-tempo, you know. Yeah, and more uh, synthesizer-ish, you know, like uh, you, yeah. you feel more electronic. Tatsuro is more organic, but uh, Kadomatsu, he went to the 80s uh, electronic synthesizer type of bass, which I love too, but it produces a different vibe. But I love it too. Like, uh, I think I have most of his 80s album. They're all great. Yeah, I think if you put both funky songs next to each other, it's yeah. definitely more bass and synth-wise with yeah. Kadomatsu. Yeah. Than with Tatsuro, yeah. but both of them have that kind of groove that once you're oh, like, yeah. wow, like it's, oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah, definitely like a hundred percent groove. You can't go, you can't go wrong with both of them. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. great. So I guess that's it for today. Thanks for introducing uh, those records. That was great, great selection. All the records that you've introduced today, I'll put them on myrecorddealer.com, so people will be able to find them and buy them directly from you. So they probably be able to contact you directly through Instagram uh, or by email or for the records you use. Some of them, if you're selling them on Discord, they'll be able to uh, go to the page where you sell them directly. Hopefully, we'll be able to do that once again in the future. You'll introduce some new records and we good. can keep talking about uh, the records you have for sale and the history of those records and all that. That was very cool. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Uh, definitely, this is very interesting channel. I've been watching the other programs as well. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Don't hesitate to talk about it around you, you know, like it's still very early and it's uh, growing organically, but it's growing well. I think now is more important also to get to know like different people from everywhere, you know, where they get their records who's selling this there's yeah. a lot of uh, record stores up and coming so like I've noticed that most of the time when media get interested in music or want people to talk about music they reach out to DJs yeah. like talk to us about the records that you play often like what's your favorite track for this for that but nobody asks those questions to record dealer but the record dealer are the ones who introduce those records to the DJs you know yeah, yeah they're yeah, the source <laughs> they're the origin so I, I wanted to like pay tribute to dealer and people who get their hands dirty and, and dig those records and that's why I, I, I wanted to start that. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a, it's a good channel for sure. Yeah. Thanks. One thing it definitely is like, you know, you have to travel to places really. You know, a lot of people, they think, oh, you can buy easily on Discogs. It's just too easy, you know, to buy on the internet. I think the, with vinyl, the fact is that you still want something physical in your hand. Yeah. It's also important to have uh, the physical knowledge that you can pick it up somewhere locally. Yeah. You know, and Definitely. support local business. I think that's very important. Yeah, it is. And uh, as I always say, like the, the human interaction, it's something you cannot replace. It's priceless yes. to be able to, to meet with someone, to talk about the record, to get recommendation about things that sound like it. Or maybe somebody is going to tell you, oh, you like this? You should try to check that because it's kind of similar. So yeah, the, the human interaction part of it is really priceless. And uh, I hope through this channel that I can try to reproduce some of it through those kind of discussions. So yeah, I'll try to keep doing it. Well, I'll definitely will be helping to promote your channel so definitely Great. yeah thanks Ted yeah. appreciate <laughs>